you, Steve. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Martha. I'd like you to take your Bible today, if you don't mind. Let's open up to Re uh, Romans chapter 1. Um, I think next week we'll pick back up in Revelation chapter 3. But for this week, I want to just kind of enter into the Christmas season. I want to share with you a message I'm calling the Christmas dynamic. And what I want us to do is look at a text in the book of Romans chapter 1. Uh, that isn't normally your focus in the Christmas season. It's not one that you would typically look at for a Christmas message, but I think that it's a good one uh, nonetheless. And as we look at this particular passage of Scripture, as I've been thinking about it, praying about it, examining it, I think that we'll see that it involves the heralders like we see at the Christmas story, uh, those who would share uh, the gospel, um, caroling, if you will, uh, we'll see the message itself, which is Jesus and his incarnation, and then those uh, who are gifted by God for the particular purpose of sharing the Christmas story with the world around us. And I, I think I said this Wednesday night, and I think I told you then that I would tell you again today uh, that if the church doesn't keep the Christmas story accurate, right, true, who's going to do it, Right. Uh, we're just going to end up, you know, drifting into a worldly sentimentalism as it relates to the Christmas season. It'll be all about romance and magic and all that kind of stuff. And there is a certain magic to Christmas, uh, not magic in the evil sense, but in the miraculous sense that God became human being in order to save us from our sins. So as we look at Romans chapter 1, I think we'll see everything that is associated with with a biblical Christmas. We see the supernatural dynamic where God actually engages mankind, and he, and he actually engages mankind through a special people, and those people are his people. Those are the born-again believers who now are to trumpet the good news because uh, Jesus, of course, has come, and that he is the Savior of the world, and if people would just embrace him, they could be saved and have eternal life. And and so God has amazingly left us on the earth, once we're saved, to begin to be part of the Christmas magic or miracle, if you will. We are part of the divine Christmas dynamic. We are actually part of the way that God keeps Christmas alive. The reason that Christmas never becomes a cardboard cutout or wooden cutout scene, manger scene, but instead is a live nativity is because you and I are actually living nativities. We are a visible expression of, of God's work in the world today. We are a visible manifestation of what Christmas is really all about, why Jesus came, what he accomplished. So Christmas to us is not really a static event. It is God moving in us and through us to keep the miracles alive before the world. Now, now I know that all of us, and I noticed up here in North Georgia, um, that every Christmas, probably more than anywhere else I've ever seen, you sing the Christmas carol, go tell it on the mountains, right? Because obviously we live in the mountains, so I'm sure that's close to your heart. Um, but I hope that as we move into the Christmas season, that we wouldn't just sing that song, but that we actually live that out. We would go and tell others all over these mountains about the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ alone. Because the reality is, society is not becoming more godly, it's becoming less godly. It's not getting closer to God, it's drifting further and further away. And even though we might... Uh, in our minds and our hearts believe that uh, we're living in, the, in kind of the central part of the Bible that belt. Surely godliness prevails here uh, in this area. But I think if you look around, you would find that that is not the truth. And while we have some basic, um, you know, traditional values as, as a community and as particularly LJ <clears throat> at large, the reality is on an individual basis, we are drifting from God. People 
are drifting from God, even though we may have still some of that small town, you know, value system in place. It is quickly changing in the way in which we live. So we need to tell the good news of Jesus. The only, the only chance of arresting that in our society, in our culture, even in our small town community, is to introduce people to the transforming power of salvation in Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ. Not just, not just country morality, not just healed people, um, you know, value system and all that. It is uh, a personal relationship. It is a spiritual, living, supernatural dynamic that transforms people. And so it's our job to go tell it all over the mountains, right? And when we think about that, as we think about what we are telling, the reality is we are simply connecting Old Testament prophetic dots to New Testament reality in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? We know, and since it's entering the Christmas season, I'm kind of telling the Christmas story. We know that Isaiah, the great prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament, chapter 7, verse number 2 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. Now, you know as well as I do, the name Emmanuel means God with us. Now, we know uh, because we, we all study and we all kind of study about our Bible, but not only that, we understand some of the cult movements that have come all the way down from the time of Adam and Eve down through the back Tower of Babel and all that, we know that culture, sinful man, under demonic influence, has constantly been tempted to mother-son worship, okay? We, we can see that uh, in, the, in the rise of modern-day feminism in the church. It's kind of a return back to that. But we know that the devil has constantly tried to counterfeit for the world what God was going to do through the Messiah. And so he said, you know, along people like uh, Samarius, and we think about Tamaz and all of that false worship in the Old Testament. We come down into the New Testament era, we see the Catholic Church and, and their worship of Mary and the son, that's the mother's son, worship. And we know all of that is idolatry. It is not what God intended. What God intended was for us to recognize, not be deceived by demonic uh, influence, but to be, be, but to understand the truth according to the Word of God, the prophetic scriptures. And the prophetic scriptures do not say that He's going to send a co-redemptorist in the person of Mary, not not in Samaria or anything like that. The Word of God says a virgin shall conceive. And when that child is brought forth, it is not just some kid who fulfills some ideas about a messianic prophecy. That child is Emmanuel. It is God himself visiting the earth and putting on human form. And that's Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 2. Then you go to Isaiah, I mean, chapter 7, verse number 2. Then we go to Isaiah 9, 2, and it says this. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shine. Of course, we know that he refers to Israel in, in specifically, but in a broad sense, all of mankind, because of their sin, because of their fallen state, they walked in the shadow of death. And, and Jesus come along and he shines the light of life in the salvation that he came to give us. Now, we also know in Isaiah chapter 9, that it says this, for unto us a child is born. Of course, we know that's the first advent of Jesus Christ. Unto us, us a son is given. We know that's the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it's like Isaiah jumps over the church age and he points at the millennial kingdom. He says a child is coming who is going to be the savior of all mankind. But the day is going to come when that child will ultimate, ultimately inherit the millennial kingdom. He will come back to the earth and he will reign over all of mankind. And so he says, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now, many critics, many folks who would deny the gospel, deny Jesus Christ, look at this verse and they say that can't possibly be Jesus because he didn't rule over the earth once he was born. But they overlook the idea that of the church age 
and also that there is a millennial kingdom coming later. And in the Old Testament, all the prophets looking through the future history, if you will, looking forward, only saw the mountain peaks of prophecy. They didn't see all the details in between. And so when the prophet Isaiah is shown this by the Holy Spirit of God, he sees the sun being born and then eventually sees the far future where the sun is actually ruling over the affairs of men. And it says his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. So this child is the mighty God. The everlasting Father, the Father and the Son are one, just like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Prince of Peace. All of these titles are Jesus, are belong to Jesus in his messianic rule upon the earth. Now, as we look at Romans chapter 1 through 4, we see this, what I'm calling a Christmas dynamic. And it's all a part of the divine dynamic by which God has mankind celebrate his son and at the same time uses it to save sinners and all the while he is trying to shape the world to its senses, right? That's what happened in the first advent. That is part of our job as gospel teachers, as those who share the good news, as those who go and tell it on the mountains. And then God uses that testimony to shake people's life up. Draw him to himself. And that's what Christmas is all about. And it's sad to move into the Christmas season and see that the whole world, by and large, has pushed Jesus aside. Now, they don't mind the manger scene because that's no threat to them. Uh, they don't mind the music and the magic and the lights and all that. But they don't want to see Jesus for who he really is. And so we must keep it front and center in our life. Because Christmas carries its own, what I call, miraculous melody. There's something about Christmas that's just music to our ears. There's something about Emmanuel. There's something about the Prince of Peace. There's something about the one who is the bright and morning star, alive on earth that Christmas day so long ago, but alive today in you and I, in the present Christmas Day, and I think Amen. that is the miracle and the dynamic of Christmas present. Now, as we look at Romans chapter 1, I'm going to try to move through this as quickly as I can. Every year, God has heralders on the scene. Y'all remember in the first Christmas, we see it in the, in the, in the gospel uh, uh, presentations, how the shepherds are on the field abiding their sh uh, sheep at night. We hear all those stories. And the angel shows up and tells the shepherds about this child that's been born, right? So at the first Christmas scene, we find that God has heavenly hosts heralding the good news of Christ's incarnation. The Messiah has come. The Savior is born. That's the angel's job in the first Christmas. But do you know whose job has been ever since? <laughs> Ours. We are the ones who are supposed to be the heralders of the good news. God doesn't use the heavenly hosts of angels anymore. The angels don't show up every Christmas Eve and begin to sing and all the world rejoices and all that. That's not what God does anymore. Today, God uses the saints to herald the Christmas message right accurate and true year in and year out. Now I see this in verse number one, really in the first part of verse number one. I want you to read with me. It says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. Now doesn't that sound like Christmas to you? No, it doesn't at all, right? Unless you're really paying attention and the Lord just kind of prompts you about something. But here's what the Lord seemed to prompt me about. Paul is a Christmas heralder. He is a guy like nobody else. I mean, he had a ministry that touched the Gentile nations. I mean, he wrote most of the New Testament. He was a Christmas story teller. He was the guy that once the angels left the scene and he comes on the scene, God used him to proclaim to all types of people, every tribe, tribe and tongue, and he preaches Jesus to them. And, and I want you to notice something. We can jump from Paul 
You say, well, what's that got to do with us? If you go to verse number five, it says, by whom what? By whom what? Don't skip the word. We. we. So that connects us to us, right? So I'm suggesting to you that not only is Paul a Christmas heralder, not only is God, uh, Paul a Christmas proclaimer, you and I, by association, being children of the Most High God, we are a testimony to the true meaning and the true power of Christmas. Jesus came to do exactly what he's done to you. Amen. Do you understand that? He came to die for you, to pay for your sin debt, to break your chains, to set you free, to save you so that you might have eternal life. And so Paul isn't the only evangelist. We are Christmas missionaries in the world today. And you are a living example of the true meaning and power of Christmas. You are a visible representation you are a visible manifestation of what God intended in Christ's first incarnation. And your life should proclaim, and your voice ought to explain what Christmas is really all about. The wonder, the majesty, and the glory of being saved. Amen. Amen? That's what it's really all about. So we see that here as we look at Paul. Paul was a man who was transformed. And if you're saved... That's true of you as well, right? Paul used to be Saul. Saul would have been a pride-giving name. It was, a, it was the name of one of their kings. It was a sort of a royal name. And Paul, he even tells us, man, in my religion, man, I was a top dog. I, I was head of the class, so to speak. I mean, I was a Pharisee in the Pharisee. Man, I was the man. That's the way he saw himself. But then he got saved. And his name's changed from Saul, which would in, induce pride, to Paul. You know what Paul means? Paul means little. Paul came to an end of himself, and he realized, I'm just a little figure in a big world. I am a little figure before a great and mighty God, but I'm willing to be used by him. And he ends up becoming a tremendous factor in, in the gospel presentation to the world, as well as all the biblical literature that God used him to write for us. So he went from a proud ridiculer who persecuted the people of God tirelessly. He became a servant, you see here in this verse, of Jesus Christ. He was an agent of transfiguration. I mean, of being transformed, not transfiguration. He had been transformed. And now God was using him to transform society. I mean, I think servanthood is underappreciated, don't you? I guess it's all in who you serve. And he served the Lord. He served God Almighty. He served the Savior of the world. And it makes all the difference in the world. And I want to tell you, that's who we serve as well. We are no different from Paul. We have been saved by God's grace. We have been transformed from sinners bound for hell to saints headed to heaven. Amen? Amen. But that's, that's, what Chris, that's the magic. That's the miracle of Christmas. We are transformed by the one who became human flesh. And notice it says he was called uh, to be an apostle. He was a delegate. He was an ambassador. He was one sent. He was commissioned by Christ. And you and I know, 2 Corinthians 5, 20 says, we are ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, we are representing the Lord Jesus Christ. We are representing the, the sphere of God, if you will, in this lost and dying world. That's what an ambassador does. An ambassador is not someone who is a resident of a certain place. They are simply people there representing someone else. And that's our job as an ambassador. We are representing Jesus. And yet so much Christianity today is about representing ourselves and what I want and what I desire. But I'm telling you, Paul was called, man, Paul Paul was a delegate. Paul knew he was sent by God. He had no selfish ambition. Matter of fact, he saw himself as the chief of sinners, right? 
He didn't see himself high and lifted up. He didn't write a self-help book. I mean, he wrote what God told him to write. He wasn't self-serving. He wasn't religious in his expression. He wasn't self-appointed to some job that he thought was important. He didn't operate in his own authority or in his own position or, or sense of power. He simply yielded to the invitation of God. And God used him in a wonderful way. Amen. By the way, I think that's what Christianity is all about. I'm going to give you something that I think the Lord gave me this week. Christianity is all about this. Three things. Ready? Got your pen ready? It starts with a divine interruption. We don't save ourselves. We don't work ourselves to, self to a position of, of being worthy to be saved. We don't earn it. We don't manufacture life in ourselves and then give it to God, right? We're all dead in our sin, according to Scripture. Christianity begins with God interceding into our life. God getting involved. God interrupting us. That's what he does. And then the second thing is, then there's divine interaction. God doesn't just interrupt us. He then interacts with us once we're saved and the Father Son, father, daughter, father, child relationship. Isn't that awesome? The, the God of all Amen. glory, the God of all eternity, the great creator of all things interrupts our little life and then engages and interacts with us on a daily basis. And as he grows and develops us and disciples us, guess what? He invites us. He gives us an invitation. We're invited to be on mission with him. We are invited to be his Christmas missionaries. Did you know that? Amen. And listen, for us, Christmas is all the time, right? <laughs> it should be all the time. We should be sharing Jesus over and over. What a mystery. What a blessing. And what a privilege that God would interrupt us, that God would interact with us, and that God would invite us to be pilgrims with him, ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that is the dynamic. God infuses the Christmas miracle and wonder into us. You, my friend, listen to this. You are undeniable evidence that Christmas is divine. It was deliberate. And it was life-changing or decisive in your life. Christmas is that wonderful dynamic. It is God stepping out of glory, wrapping himself in humanity to deliver us from our own mess, right? And to save us from our own sin and sinfulness. And the historic, it is a historic reality. He has unleashed over and over in people of faith. He has unleashed genuine transformational power that saves and prepares men and women, boys and girls, for eternal glory. Now, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to tell you, this is not the first time I've ever said this. I don't know how many Christmases I've said this to the church and to church people, but I'm going to tell you this. No one, I'm telling you, no one has any legitimate right to pontificate on Christmas. No one has that right to pontificate on the purity of God's purposes and the purpose of the Christ child coming, the provision that was in that first Christmas event, the power that was unleashed in the world, and the perfection of what Jesus did in his incarn incarnation and its ministry during that time. Nobody who is not born again has any right to pontificate on what Christmas is all about. Only you do and I do because we've experienced the real miracle of Christmas. And I know the world wants to, uh, they want to say, well, we can tell you uh, Christmas is really about this. They want to give their meaning. They want to say, they want to give their idea about the mystery or the majesty of Christmas. It's really about love and devotion to one another and family and all that. Matter of fact, we don't really like the Jesus story, so we're going to come up with our own methodology whereby men can be right with God. They don't have a right to talk about it. Only the church does. And that's why I'm saying to you, if we don't keep it front and center, if we don't share the Christmas story accurately as it's portrayed in the scriptures, then nobody will do it. 
Yeah. And eventually, people will stop hearing <clears throat> what Christmas is really yeah. all about. Yeah. It'll just fade away and it'll become some pagan, uh, pathetic, perverted view of romance and interaction and all. You can just see it already developing in our culture. So that's the Herald verse. But notice, secondly, the carol itself, or the message. I see that in the last part of verse number one, all the way through to verse number four, where he says, he's uh, separated into the gospel of God, which had promised aforetime by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. In other words, God promised concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of what? The seed of David refers to the physical life of Jesus Christ. He is of the lineage. He is a physical person, and that's referring to his incarnation, according to the flesh, he says, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. So that says that Jesus was more than just a physical being on the earth. He was indeed the Son of God, and the proof of that was in the resurrection. So let me, let me just run through this very quick. Notice, first of all, as we look at the Christmas carolers, or the carol itself, this would be number two in your outline. The A is, notice the Christian's compulsion, or the caroler's compulsion. They are set apart, they are appointed to the gospel of God. <coughs> we are messengers. We are the ones who are to share the good news of God. And then he goes on and lays out what that gospel is. The gospel isn't just the gospel of Jesus, about Jesus Christ. I saw on Facebook recently, I thought this was awesome. I thought this was awesome. I know you all think I'm mean for saying this, but I'm going to tell you, I thought it was awesome. Your personal testimony is not the gospel. That's not the gospel. What we're reading about, that's the gospel. The good news is that God became man to die in man's place so that men can live. Yeah. And then when we accept him by faith and believe on him, we're saved. And we have eternal life. That's the gospel. That's just not my testimony. But anyway, he lays it out here. The good news isn't just about Jesus Christ. It's God's good news for us. Now, here's what I want you to get. God has removed the distance that sin puts between us and him. God has delivered us from the bondage that sin has brought into our life. God has, has changed our destiny. He has delivered us. Uh, from heading in one direction, which leads to destruction, to going in a new direction that leads to eternal life. God has, in essence, elevated our destiny. Amen? And, and I think that may be even an understatement. It may be the ultimate understatement. Because God, here's what he did. He took you off the road to hell and put you on the road to heaven. Amen. That's what he did. He, he took you from the bondage of sin and set you free in the spirit. He took you from damnation or headed to damnation to, to eternity in glory with him. And he took you from sin, cursed life of misery to being a set apart saint of God, yeah. a child of God. Man, that's the good news. Amen. And that's what Christmas is all about. That should be our compulsion. What Jesus has done for us, what he can do for everybody else, we ought to be just compelled to go out and tell people what Christmas is really about. Verse number two, notice the confidence of the Christian or the carer. We can sing the good news with confidence. What does he say? Which he, referring to God, had promised afore by his prophets. Where? In his holy scripture. You want to know God, you need to get in the word, right? You ain't going to learn it anywhere else. And when we look at this particular text, what he's saying is, we have God's word on this. You can go sing, you can go tell it on the mountains, because you've got God's word on it. He told you in the Old Testament. He told you in the scriptures. He told you beforehand through the prophets of old. He's already proclaimed it. And what the incarnation reveals is that God is faithful to his word. Amen. What he promised, he fulfills. You say, why is that important to us? Because he promised to come again. Yeah. You better get ready. Right? You better get ready. So we have God's word. We have God's promise. We have God's assurance. We have God's guarantee. 
God, his faithfulness is the bedrock of our eternal hope in Jesus Christ. Y'all remember that song? I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Well, Christmas is kind of like that. I need no other argument. I don't need any other plea. It's just enough that Jesus came and that he came for me and for you, for lost humanity. Jesus was no divine afterthought is what I see right here. He is the very heart of God. He is the miracle of Christmas. He is the divine gift from God at Christmas time and the giver of wonderful gifts unto his children. I could read 2 Corinthians 1, 2, but I can see I'm running out of time, so I better hurry along. So notice thirdly, not only is the Christian compelled to tell this good news to the mountains, not only are we confident because God keeps his word and God's faithful in what he said, he carries out, and we can live based on that. We can preach based on that. We can move forward with that assurance. And then notice the message itself in verse number three, and that is concerning his son, Jesus Christ. This is referring to the incarnation after the seed of David. Fulfilling prophecy. Jesus Christ is the yea and the amen of God. Everything that God promised he was going to do, Jesus fulfills. Do you understand that, right? And, and what hasn't been fulfilled yet, Jesus will yet fulfill it in his future advent, his second advent uh, to the earth and then throughout the eternal uh, state. The Savior was delivered, right? He was delivered to the earth so that he might deliver us by offering a sacrifice on our behalf. Remember uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He became sin who knew no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Mm -hmm. I mean, hallelujah, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus, it says, He, now notice it says, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's not by accident. Jesus refers to the fact that He is the Savior. Christ is the word used for the anointed one, the Messiah. And Lord, of course, we know that he is the God of all glory, the creator, the sustainer. So not only does, does this Christmas herald, herald of this human angel, if you will, he's not really, but he's just, he's a herald of like the angels were. He's preaching the gospel, the good news of Jesus, who is the son of David. But he goes a little further and he says, not only is he coming to, as, as our savior, but he's going to leave as our deliverer. He's going to conquer the grave. And you see that in verse number four. We see Christ's departure here. And it reveals the divine nature of the one who is incarnate in the flesh. The one who was born after the seed of David in the flesh. He was declared to be the son of God with power. And how is that? According to the spirit of holiness. And what was the event that says Jesus was more than a man? It was the resurrection. That's what he's talking about. I'm telling you, Christmas is packed full of power, isn't it? And, and this word here that, that says declared to be, that word declared means to be marked off as different from any and all others. This Messiah, this Jesus was the prototokos. He was the highest in rank and order of all who had ever been born. He is the Arche. He, like you see in Revelation 3, where it says he's the beginning of the creation of God. That word is Arche in the Greek, and that means he is chief over. He is the primary one. He is the one of all preeminence over all created things. So what was the declared event that reveals Jesus was not just a human being. It was the resurrection. It was the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection trumpeted the good news that the baby born so many years earlier was indeed the Lord of glory, God incarnate, God of all power, even over the grave. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Amen. What a Savior. And even as I'm preaching here today, I believe that I am operating under what I'm calling the divine Christmas dynamic. I am singing the carol of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I am singing the carol of Emmanuel, God with us, for us, in us, right? That's Jesus. And, and so you should be singing as well, right? All you citizens, we ought to be singing of heaven above. Glory to God. 
all glory in the highest, right? Isn't that, isn't that how the old uh, carol goes? Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Amen. I mean, Christmas is Amen. awesome. And I'm going to just say it again, and I know we're out of time, so I'll skip the last one. But I want to say this. God keeps the Christmas dynamic, watch this, energized, alive, if you will, through the endless caroling of his saints. I mean, a lost person can sing carols, and they can be meaningful, and they can sound awesome and all that. But when a believer rears back and lets it fly, <laughs> and knowing the reality of what they're singing, there is nothing like it. And so I think God energizes the Christmas dynamic in you and in me. And we are to be singing, and we are to be telling. We are to be praising, and we ought to be testifying to everybody who will listen. We ought to be talking about God's grace and his mercy, about his forgiveness and his love, his life and his liberty that he gives us in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you see in the last verse, and I'm done. I'm not going to preach on it. I'm just going to tell you about it. The Christmas gifting. We have received three invaluable gifts from God. I mean, I'm not even talking about the gift of Jesus, who is the greatest gift of all. I'm not talking about the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is oh, just amazingly awesome. How could we live this life without him? I'm talking about three gifts specifically to us that I see here. He said, you are gifted with privilege. He says, whereby we are given the grace and apostleship. We are giving the graciousness. That's the ability to share the good news like nobody else. But not only that, you're given apostleship, which means you and I are now under the authority of God. And we have been delegated that authority to go and tell. What a gift. It is a privilege. But also, it is part of God's purpose. Now watch this. He says, for obedience unto the saints, or for obedience to the faith among the nations. What is he saying? You and I are living nativities in the world in which we live in. That's what he's talking about. Your life of faith, obedience to him, is a testimony to the rest of the world. Christmas was real. Amen. And it was powerful. And it changed these people's life. And it's all for his glory. And then the third thing, third gift is peculiarity. You and I are peculiar people <laughs> as born-again Christians. We're just, we belong unto God. We're different from the world around us. We are to shine for his glory. So let those little Christmas lights that is Tina and Ray and Trish and Steve and on and on and on. Let those lights shine for the Lord Jesus Christ. So the good news is God came to live among us Amen. so that we might live in him. And that he might live through us and our sins would be forgiven and we'd be set free forever. Hallelujah, right? Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the greatest gift of all, and that's the Lord Jesus himself. We're thankful for the gift of the spirit that abides within us and then our unique nature as your children and then the opportunity and the privilege and the purpose of going out and telling the world before it's everlasting too late that they might come to Jesus and be, sa be saved. We know he's coming again, and that coming will be a day of judgment on the earth. And Father, people aren't prepared. So we ask you give us courage. Give us wisdom. Lord, just give us a compulsion to go and tell others. We love you. We praise you. And we thank you for Christmas and its wonderful miracle. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 See?